This is CBC Here and Now. Well, this is the sort of hullabaloo you'd expect with a winning lotto ticket. But it's not the reception one woman received when she went to cash in her ticket. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. Well, if you're playing the lottery, you hope to win. But it seems like the only thing the woman in this story is going to win is a criminal record. Police say she bought a winning lottery ticket with a stolen credit card. The Atlantic Lottery Corporation says it was a super crossword scratch ticket that won $50,000. But when the woman went to cash in, she found a different kind of party. Here and now is Carolyn Stokes walks us through just what happened. Usually when someone wins the lottery, they show up here to Atlantic Lottery's head office to collect their jackpot. And this is typically what follows. A celebration, a cake, a novelty check, and a big cash prize. But that's not what happened here. Instead, an eyewitness tells us that when the lucky ticket holder, a 33-year-old woman, arrived to collect her $50,000 winnings, police were already here, ready to pounce. It all started on Wednesday when a man reported his wallet stolen. Police traced the fraudulent credit card charges, including a winning lottery ticket bought at a store in Paradise. And that was the clue that police needed, so they staked out Atlantic Lottery's head office. So what happens to the $50,000? Well, many people on social media think it should go to the victim because after all, it was his credit card that purchased the ticket. But under the rules, no one can benefit from the illegal exploits of someone else. So the money stays with the ALC. So the woman didn't get all of the usual hoopla. Instead, she's charged with two counts of possessing a stolen credit card and five counts of fraud. But that's not all. Police also impounded the vehicle she arrived in. The woman who drove her here had a suspended license and no insurance. So after a promise to appear in court, police just left both women here by the curb to wait for a cab. And as for the victim, well, at least he knows what happened to his wallet. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's more runs toward the Center for Nursing Studies and definitely more runs towards the Marine Institute. Certain areas aren't being serviced right now. Uh, the snow clearing has been a big issue for like where the bus stops are. All aboard a new bus proposal? It could see more MUN students parking their cars and boarding a bus. An update tonight on the warehouse fire that hit the Community Food Sharing Association hard and triggered a tremendous outpouring of support. As we told you last night, the charity has found a temporary solution for its food storage problem. Today, the group was given the keys to an idle Eastern Health property. Here now is Mark Quinn is live with that story tonight. Mark? That's right, Debbie. It's been a really tumultuous few days for Egg Walters. And of course, we all saw how despondent he was after that fire on Wednesday. But today, I'm happy to report there's some good news and things are looking up. Overwhelming, maybe. Today, the Community Food Sharing Association was given the keys to a 5,000 square foot facility, a warehouse that Eastern Health used to use for its food services. It's rent free, and the province will cover the building's expenses for at least six months. What the priority was is to get them in a safe place so they can get back in supplying food banks in our province with the food that they require. Walters has been working tirelessly to recover what the association lost in the fire but he deflected attention from himself and the association. You know, they're not doing it for us. They're doing it for mom and pop and the kids or go to food banks across the province and that's the, that's the big beneficiaries of what the province has done today. Now, this may prove to be a temporary solution, and they are looking for a permanent warehouse to keep their food in. But uh, today, uh, Egg Walter is really focusing on the good news. He said that that fire uh, meant that they lost about $300,000 worth of food, and already, he says, they've collected about $300,000 to replace what they've lost. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. Now, we have more follow-ups from other parts of the province. On the West Coast, donations to replace some of that lost food are piling in. 
The food bank in Corner Brook received dozens of calls from people wanting to make cash donations. And up the street at Coleman's Grocery, staff there announced a $10,000 donation to the Community Food Sharing Association. And customers also encouraged to buy these $10 grab bags for the food bank or swipe the food for friends card at the cash register to donate all money uh, that they can. And most of the cash, or say all that cash that's raised in this part of the island, the Avalon, and those locations, that will go to replace the food that was lost in the fire. Choose for myself, I, I, I guess being a, a local crone here, um, and anytime that we can help out, and me and the local company too, Ed, for, for Coleman's, um, anytime that we can help out in the community, it's, it's a huge, huge, huge thing for us. And fundraising initiatives are popping up all over the province. Even the little ones are getting into the giving spirit. Jack and Gabrielle Kelly Brinston have been running a food drive in Grand Falls, Windsor for five years now. They typically hold it later in the winter when donations have dwindled and demand is at its peak. But because of the fire, the brother-sister team has decided to kick off their fill it up with food campaign early. They'll have food barrels at Town Hall, Joe Byrne Memorial Stadium and Windsor Stadium for the next two weeks. And they're asking people to bring donations when they swing by. Well, the story today for most of Newfoundland was snow squalls. This is what it looked like for most areas. This is uh, Wayne Crummy's uh, view this afternoon. And then we'll take a look at this one, just how quickly things change. So this was this morning at about 930 this morning. Trudy uh, captured this in her backyard in Norris Point at 230. This is what it looked like. And then five minutes later, even worse. So whiteout conditions seeing right across uh, most of the province tonight, or at least rather Newfoundland. We're going to see the snow squall potential continue through most of the day tomorrow. And then it looks like some snow is on the way for parts of the Buren and the Avalon for another system that moves through Saturday night into Sunday and then just cold up through parts of Labrador. I'll have all those details in your full weekend forecast when I come back. Anthony. Thank you, Ashley. Former RNC Constable Steve Kernew has been fired. Police won't say why, except that it's not because of the charge that he's currently facing. Kernew pleaded guilty to violating an emergency protection order in court last week. Now that charge is usually laid in domestic disputes. It isn't criminal, but it does carry a maximum penalty of $2,000 as a fine and six months in jail. Police say Kernew's breach did not involve violence and that it wasn't the reason he was terminated. A decision in his protection order case is expected later this month. Kernu formerly served in the RNC's General Investigation Unit and as the force's media relations officer. Can't say for certain. The co-founder of the Tim Hortons empire has died. Ron Joyce helped launch the donut chain with former NHL player Tim Horton. Like many Canadians, the Nova Scotia native was an avid drinker of Tim Horton's coffee. I drink five a day myself. I drink five coffees a day. Yeah, I get up in the morning and I use Tim Horton coffee, of course, but I have my you own machine. Rel you look relatively well for a man who does It's that. supposed to be good for you. Oh, it's good for you now. That's what I understand. Who said that? And we bought a Tim Horton store back in the 1960s and eventually sold the company to U.S. fast food giant Wendy's for $600 million. That was in 1995. Ron Joyce died at home in Ontario. He was 88. His family was by his side. One of the people reacting to that death is Elaine Dobbin. Ron Joyce called his friend earlier this week, and Elaine Dobbin will talk about that friendship and the man behind the big name that's coming up in just over 15 minutes on Here and Now. One of the leaders in the fight to create the Halibu Mi'kmaq First Nation has received one of the country's highest honours. An elder and cultural mentor to his community and to Mi'kmaq across the province, he strives to preserve and celebrate their unique identity. Elder Calvin White was appointed to the Order of Canada in Ottawa today. He has spent 50 years advocating for Indigenous recognition and rights in the province. He was instrumental in organizing the Federation of Newfoundland Indians and the Bay St. George Mi'kmaq Cultural Revival Committee. White is a former chief of the Flat Bay Band, the newest band to be federally recognized. He is the first member of the Halibu First Nation to be inducted into the Order of Canada. Memorial University wants to ease traffic congestion and parking problems on its St. John's campus by encouraging students to ditch their cars and board a bus. Sounds simple, but is it? Here now Cease Hair reports. 
If this proposal goes ahead, it means more buses more often coming to campus. Munn is proposing a universal bus pass or a U pass for full time students at its St. John's campus, Marine Institute, and the Center for Nursing Studies. One that makes taking the bus better than taking your car. Expanding service a little bit with improvements in Paradise, looking at express park and ride options at the Glacier Arena, uh, the Paradise Double Ice Complex, as well as the uh, Jack Byrne Arena in Torbay. The estimated cost is $139 per student per semester, fall and spring, about $30 cheaper in the summer semester. It would be super helpful because the bus pass now is very expensive, I find. It's about $275, I'm pretty sure, for four months, and that's kind of pricey for students. Considering we're all poor students, we need to budget our money as best we can. If it goes ahead, students will see the new fee added to their tuition at the start of the semester. Some may be allowed to opt out, but not many. For example, not if you live within a kilometer of a bus stop. And that's a concern for the students' union. For all the conversations we have at the university, I was about having a universal opt-out, so students having the option not to have the U-Pass if it was not something that they were going to benefit from having or using. Students are telling us that they don't want to wait an hour for buses, so let's see what we can do to reduce that wait time. They told us that they want improved evening and weekend service. The students will have some say in this matter. They get to vote online later this month. If this gets the go-ahead, implementation could be in the fall of 2020. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Order! 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 Which, I mean, I have 19 MLAs, so it's not nearly as uh, loud. Okay, so it's not quite the same in this country. House representatives from across Canada are in Labrador this weekend. How do they keep a house in order? Stay tuned.
This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. Well, driving around uh, St. John's and Portrait Cove, St. Phillips, it kept changing every three minutes. There was sunshine and could barely see. Yeah, it needed your sunglasses at one point, yeah. and then you were in complete white conditions. Headlights. Yeah, and then <laughs> headlights. Yeah, that was certainly uh, the story today. And we noticed, uh, obviously, or on, <laughs> as well as much colder temperatures today. Yeah, I was. didn't even want to go out this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> it was even very though the sun cold. Was, even though that sun was shining, those wind windy. chills. Yeah, it was definitely. Windy. Yeah. Definitely. Spring yesterday, back to winter today. <laughs> and very much the same, just even in five minute period today. <laughs> so if yeah. we take a look at the temperatures uh, down to the minus or right now we're seeing temperatures in the minus double digits across most of Newfoundland and up through Labrador into the minus 20s. Now factor in that wind chill, it's feeling closer to minus 39 up through Labrador City, minus 36 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and then temperatures feeling more like the minus 20s for most of Newfoundland. And as we head through the night tonight, that's exactly what we're going to see. Uh, continue to see those wind chills in the minus 40s, even up through Labrador overnight and then into tomorrow afternoon. Same thing. So temperatures aren't really going to move much over the next 24 to 36 hours for most of the province sitting in the minus double digits in the afternoon tomorrow and then up through Labrador, much of the same thing. So taking a look at the satellite and radar for today, those snow squalls certainly were the story. We're seeing them on the West Coast. Whiteout conditions being reported for a number of uh, highways. And then same for the Buren Peninsula and then parts of the Avalon as well. Those uh, the snow squalls are more variable for the Avalon and we're going to see that continue as we head through the night tonight. So we definitely still have those snow squall warnings in place all along the west coast, south coast, including the Avalon. As we head through the night, those temperatures are going to stay quite cold as well. So sitting in the minus uh, double digits overnight, Port of Vass is actually going to see that temperature climb a couple of degrees and then hover around the minus single digits for the Avalon as well. And then still looking at that risk of snow squalls and windy conditions. Southwest winds 60 gusting 80 along the coast and then along the northeast coast. We're seeing those winds out of the southwest as well. A little bit less, so somewhere between 50 and 60 kilometers per hour tonight. Up through Labrador, though, still looking at that slight chance of a, a few flurries for both western and central Labrador. Temperatures actually going to climb for Lab City up to about minus 23. And then we are going to see those temperatures climb through the day tomorrow. But taking a look at that future tracker, we can see still looking at that lake effect or sea effect snow right through the morning hours tomorrow. Likely less intense tomorrow, but still looking at that potential through the afternoon for the West Coast, South Coast and the Avalon as well. Not uh, not quite as intense, though, as we're expecting or as we saw today and then up through Labrador. Uh, should be a nice day tomorrow. Not too bad. Mix of sun and cloud for the most part. Those temperatures are actually going to climb up to uh, a couple of degrees warmer than we're seeing today and then stay nice through the evening. Can't rule out the chance of a few isolated flurries, but certainly looking nice. And then down through the Buren and the Avalon, another system moves in Saturday night into Sunday. This one uh, just skirts the area, so we could see a potential snowfall with that one, but we'll definitely get into that when I come back in a little bit. But for tomorrow's forecast, uh, temperature sitting again quite cold through the day so between uh, minus nine minus eight and minus nine for most of the uh, Newfoundland and then up through St. Anthony minus 12 the Avalon should sit in the minus single digits through the day tomorrow southwest winds still staying quite brisk and then up through Labrador again another uh, nice day as far as uh, temperatures go along the west coast and then Lab City sitting at about minus 21. Those winds are still going to stay quite brisk though, so wind chills will certainly be a factor. So I mentioned that snow for the uh, Saturday night into Sunday. I'll have all those details when I come back. Order! 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 I know what I'm doing. The key point is persistence. If the Honourable Judge... Order! Order! If the Honourable Gentleman wishes to press his amendment, he is entitled to do so. But, oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. I'll be the judge of that. Oh, oh, the House must calm itself. Zen. <laughs> Almost as loud as his tie. That's UK House of Commons Speaker John Burko keeping order during some obviously raucous Brexit votes. 
Well, Canada's federal, provincial, and territorial houses of representatives would follow a similar Westminster system, and this week most of them were in one place. The 36th annual Presiding Officers of Canada conference is happening in Happy Valley Goose Bay this weekend, and our Jacob Barker swung by the meeting to ask a question, just how do speakers across the country keep their houses in order? People are speaking out of turn though, what do you do? Well, that's when you, you've, uh, the local, the international media has seen recently uh, Speaker uh, John Burko in the, the UK. Uh, yeah. He'll be, he'll, to 650 MPs, he's going to be yelling, order, which, I mean, I have 19 MLAs, so it's not nearly as uh, loud. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you, we have the override button, so you can stop people from speaking, and uh, you call order, and uh, the members are then... Uh, sort of mm -hmm. by their by our rules mandated to sit down so my style of speakership is just uh, I'm just being being buckwatts or as close to buckwatts as I can rule with a uh, with a fairly firm hand uh, one of the main things that I try to do is that regarding control like if things seem to be kind of getting out of control uh, the best thing that I can do in those situations is first of all I control myself and then then I can adapt to uh, control uh, you know, the, the situation at hand. If I've identified a member from a particular district to speak, that's the only person I want to hear from. When they're completed, then you can react, and you can react away as you, as you choose. Uh, and then same with the opposite side, I expect the, the others to, to listen again. But when they're finished, then you can go for it. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm wor still working on my style. Uh, after three months, I don't think I have a, uh, an established procedure, but if I would to uh, determine what it'll be in the future, it'll probably be uh, firm but fair. We work on the premises that under Inuit uh, principles, one of them being having a discussion and which respects the Inuit culture of coming to a discussion uh, in a proper manner, which is and that's how we try and conduct our business in our assembly. It's not an easy job. No, it's not. Uh, everybody talking over everybody else, yeah. then, you know, being... I have a new weapon, though, for the next Here and Now story meeting. Uh-oh. Oh, no! Oh, I'm going to start using that. It's got to work somewhere. It just has <laughs> a certain ring to it. <laughs> Big baby in the city. How is this a former NBA player settling into St. John's? That's ahead. Plus, we score a couple of pointers from a pro.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, as we've reported, the co-founder of the Tim Hortons Empire has died. Ron Joyce helped launch that donut chain with former NHL player Tim Horton. Like many Canadians, the Nova Scotia native was an avid drinker of Tim Horton's coffee. He bought a Tim's store in the 60s and eventually sold the company to U.S. fast food giant Wendy's for $600 million in 1995. Joyce died at his home in Ontario at the age of 88 with his family by his side. He had regularly visited this province and one of his friends is Elaine Dobbin. Well, one of Ron Joyce's friends is Elaine Dobbin. Um, my condolences on the loss of your friend. Yeah, it's a sad day. So uh, tell me about your friendship with him. What was he like? Well, he was a very generous, full of life individual. Always had a glass of something in his hand. I can tell you a funny story, actually. We're at Fox Harbor golfing, and we had an early morning tea time. Right, that's and his big golf course that he built in Nova Fox Scotia. Harbor, yeah. yeah. And uh, David Sobey, Craig, Ron, and myself. Ron showed up in his golf cart uh, with a, a bloody Caesar in his hand. And David Sobey said, Ron, what in the hell are you doing starting that stuff this early in the morning? And Ron said, I got up late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a guy who lived large. He did, um, yeah. Now, he died yesterday. He called you. Yes. And if it's not too, if it's not too personal, what, what did he say to you? Um, he just, he's, he knew his time was near, and um, he wanted to say goodbye. And we chatted for a bit, and we talked about it, and his life, and the many good times we had, Craig and I with him, and me as well. We were, we would uh, see each other a number of times throughout the year. He was a wonderful friend. Right. It must have been a very difficult conversation. It was more for me than it was for him. Um, he, 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 he was ready to go. He wanted to go. Right. And he wanted to say goodbye. And I'm glad he did. The, uh, the incredible thing about what he founded um, in Tim Hortons, which is almost, it's beyond a coffee chain. It's almost mm. part of Canada. It's become part of Canada's oh. identity. Did he ever have any clue that what he was starting was going to become almost like a fabric of, of the nation? Not, I'm sure not till the day he died, because he said to me numerous times, that he said, not bad for a fellow from Tatamagush, is it? <laughs> so he, he, um, he I, I think he still had to pinch himself that it was all real. Right. It's amazing how well he did when you, when you think about it. Not only did he do well, but he remembered everybody as well. He didn't start off with much in life, mm -hmm. but uh, he remembered to give back as he progressed in his own life. Is that one of the reasons he and Craig clicked? Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. And they, they were, they always sparred with each other, joked with each other. Um, Probably had a bloody Caesar together. More than one, mm -hmm. I can trust you. Um, we went duck shooting with him, we went fishing with him, we golfed with him, and um, he was always just right. a good friend. You also made sure that he was generous with some of his money for particular causes. <laughs> Yes, we joked one time about uh, Memorial University, and I said to him, now, Ron, uh, you've got to give at least double what I did with Mun. And he, uh, he laughed and he didn't say anything, but he did donate $8 million from Memorial University. All right, and also the Autism Center as well. Oh, he, annually, he was very supportive of the Aust Autism Society of Newfoundland and Labrador. He, was, he gave annually for a number of years. All right, Elaine Dobbin, uh, Ron Joyce certainly made a contribution to successful business right across the country. Um, I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Nice to see you, and thank you for coming. Thanks. Okay. Well, the St. John's Edge rebounded with a win last night uh, against the Halifax Hurricanes. Former NBA champion Glenn Big Baby Davis put up 30 points. It's been nearly two months since Davis signed with the Edge, and he's quickly become a fan favorite. Here now is Ariana Kelland caught up with Davis and fellow player Jaron Skeet during practice today. How has your time been in St. John's so far? It's been great. I've been having a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, experience, you know, uh, other than the weather. You know, the weather is so cold, but, you know, the people and just the culture here, just so much history, you know, and, and, and it's, a, it's fun to learn about, a, you know, a different, different country. Uh, we saw in your Instagram story that you've been uh, eating some moose sausage. 
Yeah, I'm in Newfoundland. And I got that moose sausage, baby. I had to try the moose sausage out. That's like a, you know, delicacy out here. Something that tastes awesome, especially in the morning with, you know, breakfast. Um, and then yes, bye. Learning that, you know, so that's been cool. Yes, bye. Yes, bye. Yes, bye. And just, just learning and just knowing, you know, the ways of the people around here. It's just been an awesome feeling, you know. So, uh, you know, I hope to go out and see a puffin and some whales one day. <laughs> how has the team been shaping up and how have you been helping people along? Uh, we've been doing okay. You know, uh, we've been doing uh, to the point where I feel like uh, we can do better. You know what I mean? We can uh, change some things as far as just how the way we uh, perform as a team and uh, making sure we set good screens, uh, making sure that we're on the defensive rotations, you know, just little things that count in the game that, uh, you know, that wins championships. I am here with Jaron Skeet of Edge fame. I guess you'd say you have a pretty big following here in St. John's and I want to learn how to play basketball or at least how to shoot. How to shoot. Okay. So I'm going to give you the ball, pretend right. I'm a child and you give me whatever steps I need to be able to actually get this ball in that basket. All right. Uh, first things first, which hand are you? Right. You're right with your right hand? Yeah. All right, cool. So then you're probably going to want to shoot the ball with your right hand. Okay. You don't know how to shoot a ball at all, do you? No, you. So you take your, your strong hand you shoot with. <laughs> okay. Like that. Hold on. Like this, actually. Strong hand on top and your okay. guide hand is on the side. Okay. One more so, power. So what's that called? Uh, an air ball, but it's also a good try. <laughs> I and feel like I you're think, being kind to me. No, no, no. I think the first key to shooting, too, is you got to shoot with confidence okay. and shoot every shot like you want to make it. Okay. I'm going to have my own move. Do your routine, yeah. That's cool? Yep. Do you think I'll... Okay, cool. You got to do the same thing every time, though. Ugh. Ah! That was close. Yep. Ugh. Ah. Hey, you might be left-handed. Are you, are you sure? Maybe I'm just not coordinated. Put it up in the air, though. Arc. Okay. You can jump if you have to. Ugh. Oh, that's close. There we go. Oh. <gasps> Dad, watch out. Close. Try We're going to be here a while, I think. Okay. I, be I believe in you. Thank you. Well, <gasps> that was really close. But that form was out the window. Okay. You shot like this. Oh, yeah, so, but maybe like to each their own, or is that not working basketball? Well, if you're asking me how to teach you. <laughs> oh, slip, it slipped, it slipped, it slipped. It's not even about like you not being able to shoot it, you're not, they're not strong enough. Okay. So that's part of the half the battle. Okay. I haven't been training for this weak. moment. <laughs> there it is. Oh. <gasps> ah! There it is. <sighs> shimmy, shimmy, shimmy. Oh. Okay. There it is. <gasps> Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See? Wasn't that bad? Pretty easy, right? I think it's repetition and confidence. And then eventually it'll go in, you know. One out of every other. The buzzer beater. Oh <laughs> wow. I think it was only 10 times. So that's what she told us. <laughs> even, even in slow motion, it took her a long time to get there. Congratulations, Ariana. And you know, uh, Jaron Skeet's jersey is the second most popular yeah. jersey on the team, of course, has, Carl has, English. Has anyone told them the other I don't know. meaning in Newfoundland? <laughs>
Across the country, many daycare and kindergarten classes have ratios, at least one teacher for a certain number of children. That exists to protect the vulnerable. But when those vulnerable are seniors in long-term care, there are no ratios. CBC Marketplace has been investigating what some call a critical situation of understaffing and how a woman from this province is leading the charge for change. The CBC's David Common joins us now. David, what did you find inside long-term care homes? Well, Debbie, we saw what is being described as a crisis of care, and it's being described that way because of the number of staff there are to care primarily for our elderly, but for all of the residents in long-term care. And the way it, that, that manifests, the way that you see it is uh, people who are sometimes waiting for the toilet, waiting upwards of an hour. They're not able to get there themselves, but the staff are so overwhelmed, there's so few of them, that they're ping-ponging from one place to another. They can only deal with the most urgent things, the most urgent time, and not the everyday needs. Sometimes people are being left in adult diapers um, essentially for many, many hours. Even if they've been used, sometimes they have to be left for quite some time until those adult diapers are full because there simply isn't someone there to change it. Now, this isn't to say there aren't well-meaning people, uh, you know, care workers who are in these homes. In many cases, there are. They're, they're very well-intentioned, very well-meaning. But what we keep hearing from frontline workers is there simply are not enough of them. And that's led about this charge uh, that uh, is, is being described as, as ratios. You've got to it to some degree. The idea around if daycares say you have to have a certain number of adults for a certain number of kids, why don't we say the same thing in long-term care between staff and uh, those residents? And what are the consequences of no ratios here? Well, the consequence essentially is that people get less care or they don't get any care at all. This is coming at a time when resident on resident violence is on the rise significantly across the country. Uh, that's in, in large part because of dementia, greater confusion, greater chances of aggressive behavior. And so if there is someone being pushed or punched or having a, throw, a chair thrown over them by another resident, these are all things we've seen that there may not be anybody there to see it. And if there's nobody there to see it, there's nobody there to stop it. Now, one person who's really taken the charge on this is a woman named Sharon Golden Collins. She lives in Hare Bay, Newfoundland, and she is proposing something in your province to look uh, at this issue of mandatory ratios. It's something she's calling Lillian's Law. The initial thing is the ratio. As there is a, a law for daycare, where you have a ratio of, of uh, caregivers to children. We want the same for, for um, long-term care residents, for people who can't care for themselves. So David, what about nursing staff in long-term care? Are there enough? Well, so I'm speaking specifically about what we would call PSWs, personal support workers or CCAs, go by different names in different provinces. But yes, nursing is another issue. The frontline workers are those PSWs, but nurses, very often there's only one nurse to look after an entire building in a long-term care facility. At night, those nurses uh, could be responsible for someone in respiratory distress. And so the, the Nurses Association in Newfoundland and Labrador is itself sounding the alarm, saying not only are there not enough frontline workers, but our nurses are being asked to do way more than they're equipped to do as just a single person. They want to see more people. They're warning of burnout. They're saying people are leaving long-term care homes because it's simply not possible for them to work there effectively. Mm -hmm. We'll leave it there. Uh, thanks so much, David. That is the CBC's David Common joining us from Toronto. And you can see David's full investigation tonight on Marketplace right here on CBC at 8.30 Newfoundland time. That's 8 o'clock in most of Labrador. Well, there's not much doubt vaping's popularity has boomed over the last several years, but a pair of new studies have a warning for parents. Those studies found that children and teens who use e-cigarettes are four times more likely to take up smoking cigarettes than those who don't vape. It's out of control. I, I, I really would. Uh, the feedback that we're getting from teachers, the feedback that we're getting from kids is that it's okay. And, and it's not okay. Now, studies have shown that vaping can harm a developing brain, lead to breathing problems as well as addiction, and educators say they need to stress the dangers to kids and their parents immediately. Health Canada says it is rolling out an awareness campaign and it's still reviewing 
all of the data on whether vaping is actually a gateway to smoking. Well, for perhaps the first time ever, a Canadian union is buying a Super Bowl ad. That ad is going to run during Sunday's big game, and in it, Unifor berates General Motors for its recent decision to close a major plant in Ontario. So when GM needed help, we gave them $300 from every single Canadian. And after that nearly $11 billion bailout, GM continues to expand in Mexico, leaving workers out in the cold. A move that's as un-Canadian as the vehicles they now want to sell us. GM, you may have forgotten our generosity, but we'll never forget your greed. If you want to sell here, build here. Now that uh, Unifor ad will only be seen in Canada. More than 100 other commercials will be shown across North America during the game at a cost of almost $6.8 million for 30 seconds. Yeah, a lot of union dues, and that doesn't even include the cost of the elaborate productions or the high-priced talent. Here's a sneak peek of what else you can expect. Michael. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. Hello. Good to see you again. Likewise. Please, Cosmopolitan. Nope. Tonight, I'll have a Stella Artois. <gasps> You're Stella Artois. Thank you. Can people think I'm nuts? Always there in crunch time. Wow. <laughs> Name all the celebrities you saw in the last 60 seconds. Incredible. Charlie Sheen was the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously. And a lot of people watch that game who really have no interest in football mm -hmm. just to see those ads. Mm -hmm. right. And the halftime show. No, true. true. <laughs> This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Weekend plans for the making. So, Ashley, Sunday, do you stay in and watch the big game or do you stay outside and get something done, depending on how it is? It completely depends on what you like to do. If you like winter, 
maybe go outside. If you don't, stay inside. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Yeah, I think that's good. A little bit of both uh, there. Well, if we take a look at uh, what the future tracker is saying, overnight Sunday, or rather overnight Saturday into Sunday, that's what I'm watching. It's that little bit of snow down through the Buren uh, Peninsula as well as the Avalon. That could turn into between 5 to 10 centimeters of snow, depending on the track of the system. We could see some of the heavier mounts make their way on shore and uh, upwards of about 15 centimeters isn't out of the question potentially on Sunday. But uh, into the afternoon, things will that'll happen in the uh, overnight and then clear out quite quickly into the afternoon. And we'll see uh, some more onshore flurries possible along the west coast and then some bands potentially moving through the rest of the island. Otherwise, up through Labrador, it looks like a lovely day. Maybe a uh, mix of sun and cloud with a few, few flurries in the mix there as well. And then we'll see some more cloud cover move in for parts of the of Labrador as we head towards the early morning hours on Monday. So here's a look at where I'm thinking that five to 10 centimeters is possible. Again, locally, 15 centimeters is possible if it tracks a little bit further west uh, into the overnight. So heading into the next, uh, rather into Sunday's forecast, we're looking at temperatures staying quite cold right through the weekend. So into the minus double digits again for most of the island along the south coast, a little bit warmer in the minus single digits, but still below seasonal for this time of year. So have a mix of sun and cloud with that chance of flurries for most of the island. And that's the case up through Labrador as well. So warming up uh, quite significantly for Lab City, minus 15 should be your afternoon high on Sunday. And then we're looking at temperatures between minus 10 and minus 13 for the rest of Labrador. Now looking a little bit ahead into Monday, we're going to see that next system roll in that will bring likely bring periods of snow to the island and then potentially even uh, change over to a mix of uh, either rain or snow. And then another system moves in right behind it. This one's more likely that we will start to see a changeover into rain and that's because those temperatures are going to climb right back up with that into Wednesday. And then behind that, we get into those cooler temperatures, which means we'll turn back to snow. So here's a look at the forecast again, uh, potential for some squalls on Saturday and then uh, that either five to 10 centimeters for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland Sunday afternoon clearing, maybe a few lingering flurries in the afternoon, but then uh, temperatures climbing into Wednesday. Look at that two degrees by the time that rolls around. For central Newfoundland, just uh, generally a mix of sun and cloud with that chance of flurries right through Monday. And then for western Newfoundland, squalls again tomorrow, windy conditions Sunday as well with that chance of flurries. And then it looks gray right through the rest of uh, the middle of the week. Up through eastern Labrador, uh, wind chills tomorrow, feeling more like minus 24, chance of flurries on Sunday. And then sunshine for Monday. And then for western Newfoundland, again, wind chills tomorrow, feeling closer to minus 36. And then that sunshine returning on Sunday. And then we're looking at uh, generally gray for the rest of the week. So let's look at your forecast. We'll have your weather photo when I come back. Deb. Thanks very much, Ashley. Well, preparations are underway for what's known as the world's toughest race. This Sunday, competitors from around the world will take on the Yukon Arctic Ultra. And safety will certainly be top of mind after two endurance athletes lost limbs because of frostbite last year. Now, organizers say they're trying to take steps to warn athletes of the very real risks. Some people worry those measures may not be enough. It's a long way from Southern California. Uh, you know, I live in San Diego where it's 70 degrees and sunny blue skies almost all the time. So, you know, I want to go out, outside of my comfort zone. There's a lot on the line. I'm actually an ER doctor, so I am singularly focused on avoiding frostbite. Uh, you know, my hands are my life. Another competitor is from Spain. Don't do mistake is uh, very important. Um, and be safe is more important than, than to be or not to be the lot of closes. Tonight's expedition is just a test. These new competitors have set up camp after a four-hour hike. They're following Shelley Galatly, a local guide. This year, she's hoping to walk almost 700 kilometers to Dawson City. For me personally, uh, this wet, heavy snow I find in some ways more challenging than the colder weather because it's really tough to stay dry. Safety is on everyone's mind this year, especially after some gruesome injuries that happened in last year's race. Competitor Roberto Zanda from Italy suffered severe frostbite. 
he ended up losing both of his feet and most of his hands. Robert Polhammer founded this race in 2003. He's vowed some new safety measures this year. That includes telling some people no. We call ourselves the world's toughest race, and I just want to bring across that it's not just a headline or a, a marketing slogan. It's really what it is. The temperatures can make it very dangerous, and the Yukon brings some things with it, like remoteness. Rescues are not easy. Racers will take off Sunday, and the evening temperatures could reach minus 40. Philippe Morin, CBC News, Whitehorse. Well, what a view from those benches. I wouldn't mind that right about now. <laughs> Any idea where that photo's taken? That's close, right? Nope. No, okay. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> it's far, right? It's far. <laughs> no idea. We'll have to let you inform us I will. after the break. It's on the West Coast, just okay. so you know. It's port of port. No. Uh, uh, okay, I'll tell you where it is when we come back. All right, thank you uh, for joining us once again while we are talking away in the commercial break. Sorry about that. But it is Friday and we're feeling it. And of course, it also means that it's time to see who's celebrating anniversaries and birthdays. Just have a look. Happy 96th birthday to the amazing Sarah Sexton in St. John's. And here's a big birthday. Olive Smith was 101 years old this Monday. She's formerly of St. Anthony and is in Stephenville Crossing these days. Congratulations to Ed and Nellie Smith of Queens Cove Trinity Bay, now in Mount Pearl, who celebrated their 60th anniversary on the 30th. 50th anniversary greetings to Scott and Josephine Rowe of Seldom Fogo Island, who celebrated yesterday. Happy 62nd anniversary to Ralph and Gloria Parsons of Ocean Pond, formerly of Chamberlain's. And it was a 50th wedding anniversary on the 24th for Gordon and Sylvia Shepherd from New West Valley. Anniversary greetings to Reg and Grace Reeder of Cox's Cove, who celebrated 59 years of marriage on Tuesday. And a happy 92nd birthday to Phyllis Bishop of Chamberlain's, who celebrated on Monday. And best wishes to Marguerite Weir, celebrating her 90th birthday. She's from Petty Harbor and is known for her many years at Weir's General Store and Herbie's Old Craft Shop. And there you see her great-grandchildren, Lily and Liam. 
Happy birthday to Mabel Murphy of St. John's, who will celebrate her 90th birthday this Sunday. Happy 64th anniversary to Clarice and Sarah Barney of Lancelou. Congratulations to Jim and Maude Delaney of St. John's on their 59th anniversary, which they'll be celebrating this coming Tuesday. Congratulations to Shirley and George Nichols of Deer Lake. They're celebrating their 57th wedding anniversary today. Birthday wishes to Mary Parsons Morris celebrating her 99th birthday this Sunday the 3rd. Happy 93rd birthday yesterday to Korean War veteran Gerald Linehan of Admirals Beach, St. Mary's Bay, now living in Perry's Cove. And happy 95th birthday greeting to Maria, known as Dot Goulding in Gander. And a special 101st birthday to B. Bugden of Cornerbrook, whose special day was yesterday. Happy birthday to Clayton Short from Cornerbrook, who turns 90 on February the 5th. Happy 66th wedding anniversary to Brendan and Marie Lewis of Colliers, who celebrated yesterday. Wishing Roy and Bernetta Hoskins from Cornerbrook a happy 50th anniversary. Lloyd and Joyce Bath of Twillingate, who are faithful followers of Here and Now, thank you very much. They're going to celebrate their 63rd wedding anniversary tomorrow. Celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary today, Matt and Bet. Warren of Marystown, congratulations. Also celebrating today, it's a 52nd anniversary for Linda and Walter McDonald of Burgio. Happy 90th birthday today to Nathan Yetman of Bay Roberts. And more people celebrating Milestone today. Happy 55th anniversary to Mac and Elizabeth Sutton of Lewisport. And it's a golden anniversary today for George and Mary Hobbs, formerly of Buckins Junction, now living in Amherst, Nova Scotia. Happy 57th wedding anniversary to Wallace and Marianne Tremblett of Charleston, Bonavista Bay. And a big happy birthday to Sophie Butt of Carboneer, who celebrated 100 years and lots of memories yesterday. Congratulations. Also celebrating yesterday, Colin Pike, who was 90 years of age, formerly of Charleston, Bonavista Bay, now calls Gander home. And a happy 90th birthday to Alphonsus Benoit, who will be, his birthday will be celebrated this Sunday, and he's from Marches Point, but now is in Kippens. And a happy 50th wedding anniversary to Joy and Dorman Elliott from Port Albert, who celebrated yesterday. And happy birthday to Bertha Mercer, born Brown, of Bay Roberts, who celebrated her 98th birthday yesterday. And here's a fascinating fact about Bertha. She survived the 1929 tidal wave in Buren. Wow, isn't that great? Yep. Yeah. Congratulations to all. Very nice. Go right to the other photo? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's do it. Photo is taken in Bay St. George. Oh, well, it's pretty close. Yeah, you weren't you weren't yep. far. <laughs> so gorgeous shot there. Cold and calm day across the bay. Yep. Thanks to Kip for sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Interesting cloud formation there. Yes, beautiful I'm clouds. sure that caught your eye. That's exactly what caught my <laughs> eye. Cold day to be feeding the pigeons. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, hope you have a great weekend. Yeah, have a great weekend as well from me. And uh, we'll see you back here on Monday. Yep. Good night.